Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm going to be investigating the power struggle to replace Lenin that took place in the Communist Party in Russia in the 1920s. Now this all starts because of Lenin's illness. Now Lenin was injured, a uh, bad injury in his neck when, he, when it, there was an assassination attempt on him in 1918. Um, these injuries are then believed to have led to him suffering a series of strokes from late 1921 up until his death in, in January 1924. Now, Lenin was able to work and continue to, and continue to play a, a leading role in, in the Communist Party uh, during 1922, but a major stroke in March 23 left him without the power of speech, uh, and he was removed at that point from the day-to-day -day business of government. But due to the, the rising cult of Lenin, though, Len, Lenin was said to have tried to dissuade this whilst he was alive. He, because of the way, the adulation and, and the position that he held, he still remained highly influential. And anything that he wrote would be considered to be hugely important at this time. Now, Lenin was uh, concerned about the extent of the growth of the party bureaucracy, and in particular, Len, Lenin was worried about Stalin's hold over that through his position as general secretary. Further, he was particularly um, worried about the way that Stalin might use this influence. Um, he, he had uh, earlier been accused of abusing his power, intimidating bullying communists in his native Georgia uh, um, when he had uh, his position for national for nationalities uh, within the Politburo. So Stalin was a figure who started to create a, a degree of concern for Lenin. And Lenin, at this point, starts to write his testament. So Lenin's testament is not a, a single document, but actually a, a series of letters. Um, and, and these these letters were to be read out at party congress after his death. Uh, and in it, Lenin warned that Stalin was becoming too powerful and, and that he couldn't be trusted to use his power wisely. Um, Stalin's rudeness to, to Lenin's wife during Lenin's illness contributed to, to the way that Lenin wrote very, very negatively about him. However, the Testament was also critical of other leading Bolsheviks as well. Uh, in Zinoliev and Kamenev um, <coughs> were criticised, as Lenin pointed out, their opposition to seizing power in October 1917. He also mentioned the fact that, that Trotsky had come late to Bolshevism, he'd been a Menshevik uh, beforehand. Um, and Bukharin, who he, in other ways he really praised, he, there's a, a kind of this killer sentence in there where he says his, his theoretical views can be classified as fully Marxist only with the great reserve. So <laughs> this testament would have destroyed Stalin. I think, I think if it had been made pub public right at the beginning, it would have absolutely destroyed Stalin. But it was suppressed. And, and one of the reasons for that was this other criticism of the other leaders. So none of them really wanted this to come out, particularly Zinelny Evan Kamenev, who, who um, saw Stalin as someone who's going to be useful to them in, in gaining power. And it's also part of an ongoing theme, which is with Stalin's opponents underestimating, see, seeing how, him not really as a, a particular contender to take over from Lenin. And again, much for them, as, as history will then prove going forward. So who were the contenders at this point? Well, the, the, the probably the strongest contender, the, what you would consider if you were a bookmaker back then, maybe is the obvious front runner, um, was Leon Trotsky. Now, he was the, the mastermind of, of the actual physical carrying out of the October Revolution. He was, was the leader of the Red Army that had won the Civil War. He was a, a brilliant speaker and brilliant, brilliant uh, theorist. In the theories he put forward seem to, to match very closely with Marxist theory. So his idea of permanent revolution or world revolution fitted with the, the writings of Marx about how revolution would take place. And he opposed the NEP, the New Economic Policy, which is Marx's foundations were fairly flimsy at best. So here we, we've got this guy who is a brilliant speaker, is charismatic, has, has a clear track record of, 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 of leadership in key important areas. But actually, in a way, this was what, what damaged him, because 
what they feared is that he was going to be the Russian Napoleon, that he was going to emerge from the chaos and take control as a kind of military dictator and just go on and fight loads, loads more wars. And a lot of people in the party, a lot of people in Russia were fed up of the wars with the World War One followed by the Civil War. So so these things counted against Trotsky. He's also can be seen as being um, fairly naive when it comes to the kind of fighting that takes place in the power struggle and has a degree of selflessness where he, he he tries to put party above himself and again this is not perfect um kind of personality traits and someone fighting a power struggle uh joseph stalin um it is uh, another contender mainly because he's been given this position of general secretary and it's given great control of the bureaucracy of the party it seemed a fairly um a, a, a fairly dull job i mean he he is seen as being um fairly unremarkable he see, tries to take a position in the center of the party he, he, it stays out of initial debates on the nmp um it is it, unremarkable trotsky famously described him as the gray blur uh, and he's also referred to as a uh, comrade card, uh, card index uh, and so in that way, you think, well, there's not much going on him other than actually what he can do is he can put people into positions of power who will therefore be loyal to him. And that's the that's the power, power, position of power uh, of general secretary gives him. He also did point, push some really kind of important and and popular ideas. So as opposed to Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution, uh, Stalin puts forward the idea of socialism in one country, and this would prove to be very popular. Grigory uh, Zanoniev was one of the founding members of the Bolsheviks. He, he had a strong power base in, in Petrograd, which became Leningrad and previously had been St. Petersburg. Um, he opposed the timing of the October Revolution, saying that they should have waited longer. He argued for less harsh treatment of non-Bolshevik -Bolshe socialists. He was largely on the, seems to be on the left of the party, uh, consistently opposed uh, the NEP. He was uh, an ally of Kamenev and to start off with at least a fierce opponent of Trotsky until we get late through the process and we end up with the united opposition. Lev Kamenev had been very close to Lenin in, in uh, the early years in the Bolshevik party but had opposed uh, the, some of the ideas in the April thesis and the timing of the October revolution. Uh, a key ally of Zanoniev has already mentioned he was on the left of the party and again to start off with at least an, an opponent of Trotsky. He was seen in some ways as being fairly moderate amongst Bolsheviks as he wanted to work with other socialist parties. He had a power base in Moscow, um, but possibly the wrong personality type for this kind of fierce, uh, this fierce power struggle that takes place. He was seen as being a bit too quiet, maybe a bit too soft. So theoretically quite strong, but in terms of the actual downright dirty bits of politics, maybe not the right kind of guy for the, this kind of fight. Uh, Nikolai Bukharin was a, a brilliant young theorist, um, considered the golden boy in the party by Lenin. He he was the guy who had devised the NEP, therefore was seen as being on, on the right of the party, though there are some elements of some other stuff that he, he'd he been on which would have put him on the left in terms of, of other ideas he'd put. He was highly likeable, uh, but he, he, he lacked the kind of some of the cunning of, of, of his, his opponents, notably Stalin. And even Lenin, as mentioned in in his testament, had had questioned whether Bukharin was actually truly a Marxist. So a brilliant theorist, but maybe not a pure Marxist like some of the others. So we're going to go through various stages of the power struggle. The first one is is the kind of defeat of Trotsky in 1924 to 25. So Lenin's wife presented uh, the, his testament to the Politburo. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, the, the publication would have wrecked Stalin's political career. However, Zanoniev and Kamenev both spoke in defence of Stalin uh, and they, they prevented the publication of um, of the testament. And the three of them formed a kind of triumvirate to defeat Trotsky. Now, with Stalin's position of general secretary and then the power base, uh, the power bases both in, in Leningrad and in Moscow of the other two, then this made them a really formidable um, group. 
Now, there was a various reasons why Trotsky was so disliked. He'd only joined the Bolsheviks in mid-1917, mid but immediately had become uh, one of the leading figures. He was considered to be rather arrogant. In fact, he, probably, he was rather arrogant. Uh, there was a genuine fear that, that Trotsky would use his, his uh, role as leader of the Red Army to seize power for himself. This belief was completely false, but it was something that people genuinely feared. Trotsky made a series of speeches complaining about the bureaucratization of the party, which obviously meant that the party bureaucrats weren't enormous fans of his, which when all the votes on what's going to happen on all the key issues is going to take place amongst party bureaucrats is not the greatest or most sensible move. Um, and when he attacks the bureaucracy of the party, then Stalin as general secretaries and only ever as party leader or party secretary in Leningrad and Kamenev as party secretary in Moscow, see these as personal attacks on them. And therefore, they are going to go after Trotsky. And they did. So they used their position uh, to ensure that they would win vote, votes, whilst Trotsky played stupidly fair in a way. He failed to mobilise um, his supporters. Now, this might be because uh, he was fearful of being accused of factionalism. It might be because he was trying to be selfless in his desire for party unity. It might have been arrogance and he just thought he could out-argue out, out them. So he didn't need to do the petty going around and collecting names and will you support me and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but when it came to the, the, the big debates and arguments, uh, Stalin's argument for socialism in one country proved to be far more popular than Trotsky's idea of world revolution. Now, this might be because the votes are loaded slightly because of the patronage of, of Stalin and Azanoniev and, um, and Kamenev, but, it, it, but it arguably as well that, that Stalin is more in line with the mood of the party on this, and therefore Trotsky is defeated. So having um, helped... Uh, Stalin early on in, in the blocking the publication of the Testament and having worked with him to, to defeat um, Trotsky. The, the left then um, found themselves outmaneuvered by Stalin and, and this had, this started to um, to come about as they noticed that by mid-25 he was really starting to fill um, fill the the party with his own supporters rather than people who would support them. Now, to get Zinoniev and Kamenev out of the race, Stalin needed to form a new alliance, and the new alliance that he found was with Bukharin in support of the NEP. So there was a debate in the 14th Party Congress in, in 25 when, about whether the NEP should be continued. Now, the NEP is seen as a temporary deviation from orthodox ideology, so it, it's not something that's ever going to be permanent. However, there are a series of debates about when is the right time to cut it off. Um, so at this point, the left are arguing, as they always have done, that the NEP is just not Marxist and it should go. But Stalin sides with Bukharin because actually at this moment in time, the NEP is fine and it should be allowed to continue a few more years. Um, and then we've got Zinoniev and Kamenev bizarrely being joined by Trotsky in arguing that it should be ended immediately. Now, the NEP was popular, it was bringing about results economically, uh, and Stalin now controlled the party congresses through, through all the appointments that he made, so the party retained the NEP into, in 1925. And, and in response to this, Kamenev, Zanoniev and Trotsky came together to form what was referred to as the United Opposition, arguing against the NEP and also in favour of permanent revolution. So this is the idea on which Trotsky has already been defeated. However, this is not an easy alliance. Um, the Zinoniev and Kamenev have been busily attacking Trotsky not long before this, so they can quite easily be accused of hypocrisy and inconsistency in terms of what they are doing. And, and the, these three, the United Opposition, have to constantly be wary of the accusations of factionalism because they are essentially disagreeing with decisions made by party congress. And therefore, we go back to this law against factionalism that Lenin had, had brought in earlier. They were able to put their views forward at the meeting of the Communist Party Central Committee in 26, but their ideas are defeated. As a result, they are banned from speaking at the 15th Party Congress later that same year. Now, they continue to work in secret, again, really opening themselves up to accusations of factionalism, and putting themselves in a great deal of danger. And this came to a head as they appealed to the workers of Moscow to go on strike in opposition to government policy. 
Having done this, they were removed from the positions in power and they were replaced in the Politburo by men who were loyal to Stalin. So we again, we see Stalin securing his grip on power. In 27, Zanoniev and Kamenev were allowed to retain their membership of the party after they renounced the Trotskyite views of um, permanent revolution and opposition to the NEP. Uh, but Trotsky himself stuck to his principles, refused to aban abandon them and was therefore sent into exile in Central Asia. Um, now, this exile then it goes even further and he's thrown out of the USSR altogether in 1929. And uh, as we look later on and we get onto further details, we'll see that he comes to a rather sticky end in Mexico. So Stalin has used Zinoniev and Kamenev to defeat Trotsky, and then he has sided with the right to defeat the left, the united opposition of Zinoniev, Kamenev and Trotsky together. So he's now on board with the right, or so it would appear, but not for very long. Um, because again, Stalin was in tune with, 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 with changing attitudes within the party, and the NEP, which had been popular, was starting to, to lose its popularity. Now, Stalin exploits this to get rid of the right of the party. So, Stalin skillfully shifted his position to oppose the NEP and adopt some of the policies Kamenev and Zonia had previously promoted, ideas such as rapid industrialization and collectivization of agriculture. Now, again, you would think this would open Stalin up to accusations of hypocrisy. But remember, the discussion has always been on timing. So he could argue he was being consistent because it wasn't the right time in 25, 26, but it was the right time in 27, 28. So he turned on Bukharin and the other members of the right. So Stalin proposed a five year plan for industry and collectivization of agriculture. Um, this latter policy would involve forcing peasants to give up their land and animals, pulling their resources into huge collective farms, and these farms would be uh, essentially run by the state. Now, Bikarin argued very strongly against Stalin, arguing that forcing peasants into collective farms would lead into peasant resistance and food shortages. He was right, but the argument was not a, a hugely popular one. And he proposed a, a gradual process, progress towards a social economy, economy, but by maintaining the NEP for even longer because it created prosperity amongst the peasants and that prosperity amongst the peasants was needed to stimulate it, to stimulate industrialization. You needed some some people in the economy to, with money and to generate demand and then that would lead to industrialization to, to meet that demand. But the party turned against the, the NEP. Now, Stalin used resentment against uh, the Kulaks and the Neat Men uh, as part of this and, and against not ide ideological arguments, so, so, so suggesting that it didn't ideologically fit with Marxism. Uh, and Bukharin and, and his allies on the right, uh, Rykov and Tomsky, were all voted out of the Politburo and replaced again by men who were loyal to Stalin. And the Politburo was now completely filled by by men who Stalin had promoted and were therefore totally loyal to, to the man they nicknamed um, Vyozd or the boss. So Stalin has skillfully outmaneuvered everybody and he is pretty much uh, undisputed head now of the Communist Party. So why was he successful? Well, some of it is political skill, and 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 we have to give uh, Stalin some credit for some of the stuff he achieved. So he portrayed himself as a moderate figure in the centre of the party, which allowed him to outmaneuver both the left and the right. Um, he recognised early on in the power struggle that this would mainly be fought behind the scenes and at party congresses, so he could use his position as general secretary to build up a network of support within the party. He was also brilliant at, at reading the mood of the party, and so. Part of it would be that patronage, essentially people would vote for him because he'd put people in the positions um, that they had. And part of it was going would be, well, actually, I'm going to side with the, the group who were backing the NEP at this point because the NEP is popular. I'm going to back the group that um, 
are attacking the NEP at this point because the NEP's popularity has dipped. So in that, he played a very skillful game. He also used Lenin's uh, legacy to promote himself. He was he was chief mourner at Lenin's funeral. He kind of rather infamously gave Trotsky the wrong date and then could make a, make a big deal of the fact that Trotsky didn't attend the funeral. He routinely quoted Lenin in his speeches and writing, and he, he did an awful lot to build the cult of Lenin, but also to build this idea of him as Lenin's right-hand man and lots of kind of redoing of photos and all kinds of things like that to try and make him look like he was closer to Lenin than he really had been. Now, the second major area or reasons for his success was the weakness of his opponents. Now, all of his opponents underestimated him. So Stalin was seen as this great blur, comrade uh, the card index, and, and therefore wasn't really considered as, as a potential future leader. Now, Trotsky was a brilliant orator and, the, uh, and the, uh, theater, uh, theorist, um, but it was not well suited to a power struggle. He, he tended to put party ahead of himself. Um, he didn't see the need to do the boring bits of kind of shaking hands and, and I, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours behind the back type stuff, behind closed door stuff that Stalin was really good at. He just thought his speeches wouldn't win people over. If he didn't win people over, then he would just accept the result and move on. When we get the united opposition of Zinoniev, Kamenev and Trotsky, they combined their strength too late and, and, and left themselves really easily open to accusations of hypocrisy and factionalism. So, so Stalin, when there had been the big attacks on Trotsky, had stepped back a bit. When, when um, Zinoniev and Kamenev got to the stage they wouldn't even shake Trotsky's hand, Stalin still had. So when they are then united with Trotsky, it looks really odd. And again, it put, put, makes, makes Stalin look better. The, the right opposition allowed themselves to be used by Stalin to defeat the left, and then they were destroyed themselves. So the divisions over the ideologies are our third kind of key point. Of the, the, the divisions over the NEP played into Stalin's hand, and, and this fits in with the political skillfulness where he, he was able to judge the mood. But also some of the the idea of Stalin as a theorist can't be completely dismissed. So yes, he does take some other people's ideas, but Stalinism in, in this idea of socialism in one country is very much part of Stalin's ideology. And it proved to be a far more popular and flexible ideology than Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution. And, and so in this, this is another reason why Ta Stalin was successful. Now, one of the things you need to do as students is you need to weigh up which one of these areas you think are, are most significant. And that's a, a potential area where you, you could look at as part of a question. So again, this uh, video is part of my playlist on Tsarist and Communist Russia, which started all, all the way back in, in the 1850s and is going to go all the way through uh, to the 1960s. It's designed uh, for people star studying Tsarist and Communist Russia as a, an A-level uh, history unit. And hopefully there will eventually be everything you need on this playlist to help you with that particular unit. And also, if you're just interested in this bit of Russian history um, or you're studying it in, in, at some other level, just lots of good information that can help you along. If you haven't done so already, then please do subscribe. There's plenty on this area of history and other areas of history and also British and American politics, and all kinds of different stuff on the channel. So hopefully lots that can help you just to broaden your knowledge or, or maybe to help you in your studies. Thank you very much for watching.